Um, thank you so much for joining us here in person and on Zoom. Um, we are very pleased to have our own Ken Gross, director of the Walsh History Center at the library here with us tonight um, to give a presentation on a visual history of the McGuntacook River in companion to this exhibit, which hopefully you've taken a look at. If not, then I think you'll learn something about it tonight. Um, this is part of our Discover History Month series at the library in October, um, where we celebrate our Walsh History Center, have a special exhibit and um, history themed programs. And after this, the last History Month program will be Carrie Hardy's talk on the 24th, which will be in person and on Zoom. Um, and also thanks to our Discover History Month sponsor, The Smiling Cow, celebrating their 83rd year of business in Camden. So they're part of our local history too. Um, and without further ado, I will hand it over to Ken. Thanks, Julia, and good evening. I am using the microphone, but if you ever have a trouble hearing, just give me the secret hand signal, uh, and I will either turn the microphone up or speak louder. Um, and let me know if, if the Zoom people are, are being challenged by the echoiness. Anyway, good evening. Thank you, Julia, and thank you all for coming to the library this evening and, and for tuning in on Zoom. I have been looking forward to sharing these images and this information with you this evening. Um, and as Julia said in her introduction, I am Ken Gross. I am the steward of the History Center, which is on the second floor here at the library. We have thousands of photographs in our collection, and we don't get a chance to share them very often. So we have reserved October. We've dedicated October every year for being History Month. And it is our opportunity to give a talk like this and do a related show on the wall to share some of the images and history from our collection. Over the past uh, few Octobers, we have delved into our collection to bring you a visual history of Camden Harbor, a visual tour of historian N.C. Fletcher's Camden of 1884, and a visual history of the amphitheater and Harbor Park. Tonight's uh, slide talk was originally prepared as a presentation for the MRCAC, that is the McGuncook River Citizens Advisory Committee last spring. Um, and I have too many photographs and too little time, so I will uh, lead off by saying that the impression I want to leave with you is that Camden is, Camden was a mill town. It is now a destination and a tourist town. And even for me, I grew up here and it was a mill town when I was a kid. But it is hard for me to think of Camden as a mill town. Julia, yes, yes. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the Wizard of Oz. There was an anecdote from N.C. Fletcher who wrote his history in 1884. He said that the folks who developed Lawrence, Massachusetts first came to Camden and they liked it because of the water power represented by McCunnicook River, but he lamented that they took their business elsewhere and developed Lawrence into being the mill town that it became. Uh, a lot of people have given me leads, links, and references on the McGonagall River over the past several months, so I need to acknowledge that I am relying on the work of several historians, naturalists, and researchers, as well as the historians from, from centuries past and from this tons of information online as well, but most of this information comes direct from our own history center. This first slide, I think, represents is an emblem of, in a nutshell, this is the history of the McGonagall River. This is the empty shell of the Knox Woolen Company. It was emptied of its looms and spinning machines by, uh, by 1988. And so this photo comes from 1988 by a photographer named R. Barrett. And this is post-industrial Camden. This is the fate of all mill towns in all New England, empty mill buildings. And what becomes of them is then the, the saga for, for current history. But I like this photograph because um, it has the shafts overhead that carry the water power throughout the mill. If you were on a river and you had a dam and, and a mill, you had power, you could do anything with that power. Um, you could run a lathe, a drill press, a, a loom, um, trip hammers. Uh, this little small thing on the wall represents how we think of power today. 
You've got to have electricity to do anything, but it's that easy. You just plug it in. But back in the day, you had power overhead, and you would take a leather strap from your loom or from your drill press or from whatever, throw it up over this uh, spinning drum and pull the lever and tighten up on that leather strap, and you were off and in business. <coughs> this building is still there. <coughs> this is the Knox Lone Mill. We will jump back in time. What well, I think of uh, New England as having a baseline history, and that is when the, the glaciers started everything right down to bare rock. All the topsoil was gone. There was piles of gravel here and there. But this is what this is what New England looked like, uh, and this is the watershed of the Magnetic. You can this is Mount Batty, and you can see there's a grain to the uh, to the landscape. The glaciers, one mile to two mile thick layer, layers of ice dragged across the land, and it wasn't ice dragging across the rock. At the bottom of the glaciers, of course, it was embedded with stone, so this was stone on stone. The landscape was literally sanded from northwest to southeast and sanded, so you can see this is the distinctive shape of uh, mountains in the northeast. They have a easy sloping northwest side and a very steep side where they the glacier just dropped off the edge and dropped boulders and scree and all. This flat area is late Magantikuk. Ken, yes. could you tip your screen a little up so the camera shows you? Yes. Perfect. Great. Oh, Thank that you. camera. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so <coughs> this line across the map there is Molino Road, which of course didn't exist in Glacier's day, but the LIDAR <coughs> images are very good at stripping it down to whatever the bedrock is, and some features uh, show up from, from modern life. So the east-west dam is there, and that's the dams that create, that turn Canaan Pond into Magadico Lake. This <coughs> next flat stretch of water here is the impoundment behind Seabright. There's the Seabright Dam right there. And then it's just a short run all the way to the harbor with another five or six dams, which we will fly over uh, in our talk tonight. This is just by way of showing that on the mac on a macro scale, you can see the grain of the glaciers. And on the micro scale at the foot level, you can see the, the grain of the glaciers. That's Mount Batty in the background, and we're on the trail up above uh, Barrett Cove here. So we jump forward a few thousand more years um, to try to cover. I'll tell you a quick anecdote. I was in the canyons in Anasazi country looking at the ruins of the Anasazi uh, above Santa Fe, and I Came out of the uh, came out of the wilderness after a week, and I went right to the history center in Santa Fe, thinking I would find out more about the Anasazi. But I found out that history did not begin until the Spaniards got there, and so I don't want to make that same mistake here tonight. History began well before the Europeans arrived. Um, this Fanny Hardy Ekstrom wrote an Indian place names of the main coast, from which I derived this whole slide, because she does as good a job as anybody in use, telling us what uh, the, the Native American or the Indian names were for local uh, uh, the Camden Harbor. McCadicut is the very old Micmac or Maliseet name for the Indian village site at Camden. McGunticook is the more modern Indian name of Camden Harbor. McGuantiquack, which the Indians themselves did not seem to distinguish from McGunticook, is the old name of the exposed coast along the Lincolnville shore, dreaded by canoe men in rough weather because there was no avoiding it, except by a very long route far inland. For miles it extends a rocky, harborless coast exposed to all the prevailing winds. Captain John Smith finally paraphrased the old name when, speaking of the Kimden Hills, he said, Against whose feet doth beat the sea. He was not speaking of the quiet Camden Harbor and the mountains as seen from there, but of the stern Lincolnville coast and the high range rising back of it. And she goes on to say that Magnetic can be uh, de defined as probably the big, the big mountain harbor. In old times, the name of the harbor of Camden, the name extended to a mountain stream and lake to which it does not belong. 
So there's no photographs that I can share with you from the 1760s because I didn't have the edit <laughs> photography yet. The best I can do is, is a couple of maps. This map from 1764, and this is a crucial date because the this is map is by Governor Bernard, who was of course the English governor of Massachusetts. The English had just vanquished the French in the French and Indian, what we call the French and Indian War uh, in 1763. So the English were ever so eager to take over their brand new empire, which they had just extended from Massachusetts up to Nova Scotia. And this map uh, is part of Governor Bernard's survey to, to do just that. But it does have our section of the coast. This is the military road that he had chopped out of the wilderness from Saint Fort St. George to Fort Papa, Fort Pownall rather. And so I, I include this map to, to illustrate that previous point about the bold shore, which is not canoe friendly. I had a friend who uh, paddled from uh, Lincolnville to Camden, and he almost didn't make it because his, his kayak had a leak, which he didn't know about. And it was, and it sank by the time he got to Sherman's Point, and he just barely made it ashore. That's the place he could find uh, to, to come ashore. So uh, I'm strongly aware of how treacherous this shore, shore can be to canoe people, as opposed to, look at the far shore, look at the scattering of islands. This was a much more canoe-friendly route coming down from the villages above Bangor, going into Begadus here. This is the Walker River, or Walker Pond, and a short portage over into Egamogat Reach. And then you're at Deer Isle with its uh, famous carryover spot right there in the middle. Jumping forward a mere 12 years, the British are still working on their empire. This is a British chart from 1776 uh, from the Neptune series. But I show this because this is pretty much the earliest map that actually shows the Gunny Cook River. And you can see it goes inland and peters out because what's important to the British and to any sailor is the coast. The coast is pretty darn accurate. You could sail across Penobscot Bay with these charts. Um, and these four squares are the four houses. And I think this is Ogier's cabin, the Richard's cabin, probably Minot's cabin. He's the guy who first built that dam, that little thing there I take to be the Mon what we call the Montgomery Dam, dam now that he built in 1771, he being William Minot. Let's see what's next. Oh, OK. This is an overview. This is basically the current dams and uh, or current uh, remains of dams. We will look at these in, in a little bit of detail, but there's the east-west dam that's at the foot of Canaan Pond, or now the Cook Lake, Seabright, Tannery, the Knowlton Dam. And it's a cluster of dams in here. We'll take a look at them. The Knowlton, the Old Street Dam, the Oakham, uh, the Oakham Mill Dam, the Knox Mill Dam, and then at the foot is the Montgomery Dam. This map comes from 1856. Uh, in 1869, <coughs> so the 1856 map shows that the Cunnicook River is fairly full of, of, uh, of dams because it drops 147 feet in three and a half miles, which is a, it's a steep, steep and powerful river. The original settlers and entrepreneurs there, their eyes lit up when they saw the Cook River. In fact, I've heard that the angle that is drawn from Rock XX, which is on the survey by the 20 associates, they drew a line which headed inland at a very odd angle, 33 and a half degrees, whatever. Um, so that they could purposely capture all of the McGuncook River in their town because they wanted, they recognized <laughs> that, that the basis for their prosperity was going to be the power of the McGuncook River. And here's an inventory from 1869. This guy, Walter Wells, he didn't personally do it, but he, he sent away to all of the towns on the coast of Maine to find out where the water power was. So here is, he listed 15 possible sites with a head of water ranging from four feet to 20 feet up and down the McGonagall River. So this, the fact that there is an inventory, we look for inventory of fish. Um, They're really hard to find, but inventories of water power now, that exists here it is in 1869. 
So now we'll take a tour of the river, starting uh, starting with the one at the foot. This is Camden Harbor. This is salt water down here. And this L shape is the distinctive shape of the Montgomery Dam. And in 1912, the water was fed over here into the Camden Grist Mill. Um, that building is still there. I think it's once a tree, but they say that if you go in the basement or climb underneath, which I have yet to do, you can see the remains of the flume and the water wheel down there, or where the water wheel was. Uh, there's an unusual feature on this map. Here it is the old flume, it says, and that provided power to the Camden Anchor Rockland Machine Company. Um, that's no longer there, but we have photographs of the water flowing over that flume. So let's take a look. Oh, this is a 1876 photograph of what we call the Montgomery Dam with its distinctive L shape looking out at Curtis. I would guess that this area is the Bill Pond. Now we'll fly or jump or transcend up to the head of the uh, head of the river. This is either the east or the <laughs> right. It's either the east or the west dam. I think this is the west dam because this shed shows up in the next picture as well. Not quite the next picture. This is from a postcard showing, I think, the East Dam. So there are two dams separated by this huge ledge of rock. And this next photo, yes, this photo, is the only photo I've seen which has both the East and the West Dam in the very same photograph. <laughs> so it's a little hard to make out, but that shed is right there. And if I get my East and my West right, which I don't always, but I think this is the West Dam and the East Dam. And this is the hatchery. The building is still there. It's no longer a fish hatchery. But it was in 1910 when this photo was taken. So we're moving downstream. Here's the great body of water. And does anybody know the name of this body of water? It's called the, imp the impoundment or the that place in the river. I don't know what it's. What it, even the people who live along the shore couldn't tell me what is what the name of this body of water is. I'm trying to figure out where we are here. What's oh, the, the building at the bottom? That is the Seabright Mill and the Seabright Dam is right there as well. So we're looking upriver and okay. right there is where the east-west dam is. And this okay. sheet of water you is the Magunicook Lake. Right. And this next picture, these show the same buildings. This building is Jim Brown's ice house because they were harvesting ice on this body of water, storing it in sawdust in this building. And this is the Seabright Mill. This is part of the Seabright Mill. So I'll go back to the previous picture to show you. There's Jim Brown's ice house and the Seabright Mill. I don't have pictures of every single dam, but I thought I would share this one with you because it's beautiful and because um, it's, you can't see it from the road. This is the Seabright Spillway. I don't know if any of you, have you folks seen the Seabright Dam? Yes, Jen. Uh, there is the spillway, and that is the, that's the spillway, and that's the water level looking upstream. And turning around, oh no, this is upstream as well. This is that flat body of water. That is, uh, that is held back by Seabright Dam. And then now we're looking downstream, got gone down to the foot of the dam and looking down the McCunnifuck River. But when I was at this point, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a young fellow there fishing. And I thought, I guess this is my chance. I can find out what's, what's in the, this body of water. So I asked him, what are you catching? And he said, oh, you know, same thing as they have in the lake. The siren is gone now, isn't it? The, the siren was there, uh, I think. That, <laughs> like three weeks ago. So oh, okay. yeah, that is that is still there. I didn't. I thought of it. I thought it was a birdhouse. <laughs> Warning us all that the dam has given way. <laughs> So I, this is a resource um, which uh, you should all know about if you're interested in getting detail. This is a map from the Sanborn Insurance Company, and this is this is that bill. This is the Seabright Mill. Just going to zoom in if I do this. Yeah, but it does that too. 
There's an astonishing amount of detail on these sandborn. <laughs> yeah, I hit the wrong button. Anyway, I won't try to zoom in. Anyway, it says on here, I'm going to be very close and put my forehead in that camera. Weaving and finishing and pulling on the first floor, weaving and spinning on the second floor, spinning and carding on the third floor, and scouring in the basement. So that's the kind of information on these sandboard maps. And all of these maps, they're, they're 1892, 1894, 1904, 1912, and 1923. They're available at the Library of Congress site, and you can zoom into this detail. So I'm not going to show every single bill on the river, but I could, through time, and we'd be here all night long. This is just my way of showing that this is the kind of information that, that is available, and it's, it's fascinating. So strolling, rowing, kayaking downstream, whatever, we were arriving at the next mill site, which in 1828, yes, there was a paper factory here in Camden at one time, not for very long, but for about 12 years. And I don't think they made any money, these folks, John Swan, I forget who his partner was, but they went out of business after about 12 years. Um, but for the longest time, there was a gunpowder mill, and that's why we know it today as the uh, powder mill dam. So this is the Bisbee Marble, Bisbee Marble and Company's powder mill. Um, and all of these buildings, I think that thing there is the dam itself, and all of these buildings are part of the industry. And one reason that they're all spread apart is that Yes, powder mills tended to blow up. <laughs> uh, I've read several times that if you were smart, you did not nail the clabbers onto the powder grinding fact part of it. You just tacked them in place. So when it blew up, you could go gather them all up and tack them back in place. Uh, and it's a story of a guy who retired after 20 years as a foreman, and he was proud that nobody, not that it had never exploded, but nobody had ever died. His watch, he was very proud of that. So this, um, Gunpowder Mill was part of the contributed to the local industry. That is, the quarries needed a lot of gunpowder to do their blasting, and so they had a ready-made market. That's why we had a powder mill in Camden, because we had the next industry up the line was the quarries. And then for many years, it was also this site was a woolen mill, and then a chicken hatchery. Does anyone remember the chicken hatchery? Yeah, yes, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. the night burned up. Right. It lit up the whole night. Who <laughs> says Oh, no, you're right. Who knows what year? I'll have to look that one up. We'll put that in the two we looked up. It was in the mid 60s, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. And then it was the Mob Senate fight. So on that same site, this is the woolen mill, which is known as the Hughes Woolen Mill and the Lincoln Woolen Company on that very same site. Moving downstream, here is what we all call the tannery site, which was originally the Gould Plug Mill. And the Gould Plug Mill was part of the industry in Camden, but they contributed parts, plugs and trundles and other wooden pieces to the shipbuilding industry. And there is a picture, probably around 1900. There is what we call the tannery building now, but was at in that time it had transformed from the Gould plug mill to the Camden Woolen Company. Uh, again, every one of these factories has a, a long uh, history of changing products and changing hands. But you can see this fat place in the river. It's not a fat place in the river now. That is caused by a dam, which you can't see right behind uh, Camden, uh, well, I'll call it Camden Tannery. This building here is the boarding house. And this is Felton's store. Do you remember Felton's store? <laughs> OK. Um, I picked up my newspapers at Felton's store and delivered them up and down the <laughs> street. Um, but the boarding house was infamous. We have a couple of photographs. There was a uh, a strike in 1912, I think it was. Uh, the mill owners brought in strike breakers from Boston. Uh, the Syrian, it was always noted to be the, from the mill weavers from, from Syria. 
Anyway, somebody dropped a stick of dynamite through the boarding house window, and the, the uh, strike break was long gone on the next bus that back to Boston. And nobody was ever arrested. When did the tannery uh, come down? Sometime around in the 1970s. I moved here in 77. I didn't think I could remember it. Yeah. Sure. It was after 1979. Oh, okay. 79. Okay. I don't remember it too. Yeah. And then there was Risby and Bisbee. Were they the same? They just dropped the R? Um, it's it's always Bisbee in Canada. I don't know. Okay, one of them said B R I S. I oh, just wondered. Oh, okay. Well, if you're me typing, uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Oh, okay. Well, they made mistakes too. Uh, anyway, the bit if you uh, if you head up Mountain Street and you come to Trim Street, there is a large ornate Victorian house. That was the Bisbee place. Uh, Camden Tannery. Anyway, it looked like that when I picked up my papers in the morning. So the next site downstream, this is the Knowlton Brothers Foundry in 1881. This was a big business. And again, they were building for the local construction industry. They were making the iron parts that go into making a schooner. They were building, well, let's see. These things, capstan, steering wheels, force pumps, windows purchases, winches, bethel blocks, all kinds of brass and iron castings, trunnels, plugs and wedges. Um, and across the river, they had a train car factory, which made, I think they made uh, trolley cars specifically for the, uh, for the uh, quarry industry. So they were a heavy duty industry. And there's a line art. This bridge here would be the Knowlton Street Bridge, and, we're, and this is Mechanic Street here. And there's an iron foundry, a machine shop, a machine shop, a rolling mill, I think is what that says, and I can't read it. Alton Brothers, Andrea, well, 1908. Okay. 1908. So, um, the Knowlton Brothers factory was upstream from Knowlton Street and downstream from Knowlton Street. This is the Oakham factory, uh, sometimes called the Alden Oakham, Oakham factory. And it took me forever to find this photograph. I had my eye out for this for literally for years. And I finally showed up in the collection from the Berry family. This is the Oakham factory. And it, uh, the factory, of course, is, is long gone. Oakham is the material made from hemp. And everybody says, oh, it's made from old ropes. Well, there's not enough old ropes in the world to do this kind of work. This is a crew pounding oakum into all of the seams on a six mat in front of the George Wells. There's mile after mile after mile of seams that need to be sealed up with oakum, which is um, hemp, a, a loose strand of hemp impregnated with, with tar to make it even more waterproof. Um, so not just a deck, but of course every every hull uh, seam in the ship needed to be. So these guys, that's what they did for a living. Uh, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, they, they pounded oakum. Do you know if there was a market for um, caulking log houses as well? I don't, but it would have occurred to them for sure. So we're standing in this image on the left, we're standing on Dalton Street and looking downstream. And this bit of this pile of rocks, that's the remains of the Oakham Factory Dam. And on the right is the Oakham Factory Dam in action in 1899. Yeah. The next, uh, I, we, I sort of say we could spend a whole evening on Knoxville Mill. In fact, we have had whole evening on the Knoxville Mill and on the tannery as well. This was the biggest employer in town for decade after decade after decade. My great aunt Nettie worked in the uh, mill and it was actually a good job. I don't know if it was a good job for her, but, but the folks who worked there said, you got to know everybody and everybody had a common uh, goal and it was, Many of them say it was like a family going to work at the mill. Um, and the, uh, the mill is sort of famous for having a retirement policy, which 
their retirement policy was that they let you work until you dropped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but don't snare because that meant a lot. You were you were never let go because you were getting in firm. They, they would keep you keep you busy and keep you on the payroll and give you a housing, much of the housing around the mill was, was still housing. Uh, but there definitely was, as you can uh, get from this picture, there was women's work and there was men's work. These, these folks are doing women's work, and each of these vertical things is a piece of metal with an eye in the middle, and they have to thread a piece of uh, yarn through that and then tie it off because that, this bar is the heddle, which goes up and down on the, on the loom. If you're a weaver, you know better than I do what a heddle does. but. What else have we got here? Oh, this is the caption on this says this is the weaving equipment, but I think this might be the spinning equipment. Oh, the um, Fox Woman Company started up about 1862, so all of this equipment dates back to the Civil War, and it was all in use from 1865 through 1980, 1988, when the place finally closed. More women's work, the Knox closing room. So the product of the Knox Woolen Company was not garments or cloth to be made into garments. They made um, endless paper felt. They were part of the paper industry. Um, to make paper, you need to have a conveyor belt made of some water, uh, some material that water will flow through. So the water, the slurry is picked up by this conveyor belt and the water drains out and what's left on top is a very thin, very damp layer of paper. And the material that uh, was that made up that conveyor belt was wool. Wool had some excellent properties. Uh, the way it was impervious to water um, and was very tough. And the weird thing about wool is you can change its shape after it's woven. You can do fulling on it, you can pound it and work it and it gets tighter and thicker, and they counted on that. So they would make it a little large and then pull it into shape. And because an endless felt, um, I th these folks are uh, tying the ends together on that endless, uh, endless uh, paper felts. I think this is the shipping room. It looks like the shipping room. I looked at the shipping room and then they had the what did they have? Tables and scales. Well, that's not a scale, it's a clock. <laughs> uh, anyway, we will move downstream because we have more uh, more mills to cover here. This building, which most of us call the Brewster Mill, was built at the Penobscot Mill, and it was a it was a uh, mill, I believe. And oops. Oh, Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of those slides. I, I'm not going to hit the end, but hey, you're getting a preview. <laughs> uh, so, jumping forward, that's 1912 when it was new, and jumping forward 25 years, it's still there, and it's still there, and it looks just like that. And now we're at the mouth of the uh, harbor, at the end of the uh, end of the river. I love this photograph. It has so much information in it. This is the Elk Shape Montgomery Dam. This is, well, to clarify the terminology, the dam holds water back. A spillway lets the water go. So technically, this is the dam. This heavy duty masonry wall, which you'll recognize, but it's, it's now there as well. That's the dam part of this dam. And this is the spillway part of the dam. And here, I promised you we have photographs of the, the spillway, which is no longer, this spillway is no longer there, but that's the uh, flume that led power to the anchor factory over here on the left. Now we know that this uh, photograph is from before 1903 because this building burned down in 1903. That's the um, Harbor View, I mean, the Mountain View House, which was the hotel, which was right here where the library is. Yeah. And our benefactor and uh, generous patron, Mary Louise Curtis Bach, bought up this property about 10 years after. She bought up this property for the purpose of building the, the Canyon Public Library here 15 years before the library was built. She had such vision and such means to do that kind of thing. 
Here is the Camden Anchor Factory or Rockland, Camden Anchor Factory hyphen Rockland Machine Company. And this is a distinctive feature of uh, mills. You didn't want to have, you didn't want to light lanterns, but you did have to have light. So during daylight hours, this is how you lit up the factory floor by having lots and lots of windows. Oh, and over here is the flume again, which delivered power to the trip hammers inside the, uh, the forge here. They made enormous anchors. There we go, enormous anchors. There's no steel, there's no coal in Maine. So all of it had to be imported. But I read one description that said that they would get used railroad tra uh, tracks um, and they had a machine which would cut off at a chunk cut right down through a railroad uh, track um, in, in their building. And you've probably have not seen it as I have always missed it. There's a small multi down there. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> there she is, um, our benefactress. She was the daughter of the richest man in the world. I read one account that said that Cyrus H.K. Curtis was the richest man in the world, and she was the only child, and she um, she knew how to get her way. She had the means to get her way, and she had this tremendous vision for Camden. She helped Camden turn the corner from being a mill town to being the Camden that, that you see today. So in um, 1930 and 31, she hired the most famous landscape firm in the country, that is the Olmstead firm, to, to design um, Harbor Park and the, uh, the waterfront here. So this is what it looked like before the Olmstead got to it. This is the mill pond. We're looking over the lip of the uh, dam. It was pretty, pretty rough. What else do we got? Oh, um, this looks darn familiar. In fact, this mechanism is it's still, right, there. still there, not that very same one, but the same mechanism to open the sluice gate. And you can see this is the L-shaped uh, dam and the mill pond. Here they are surveying, this is the team from, uh, from the Olmstead surveying, what, uh, literally surveying it, and this was their result. This is uh, the, the map that they charted out, which is a pretty, Cool to show what it looked like before. Um, they were really taken by the idea of this um, spillway and this waterfall being a visual attractive feature at the head of the harbor. So they extended it. The spillway, when they saw it, was 70 feet wide, but they added, they knocked down 30 feet of the dam and made this all spillway. So now it's 100 feet wide um, at the head of the harbor. Other than that, most of these features, the heavy duty masonry wall is there. They spruced up the, uh, the sluice way and uh, ran the sea, sea wall across the harbor. This building here shows up in a lot of pictures. That's Harville Boathouse. He was a select board member. And so they, they decided not to go there. They did not tear down his means of making a living. They waited until he passed away in 1952 and then they tore it down. And, and rebuilt the seawall. The homestead were great at uh, documenting. So these are, I love these photographs. This is just a, a small sampling of the number of photographs. But the, oh, this is how you move blocks of granite around. Um, you'd have a series of derricks, and this one would swing it off the barge onto shore. The next derrick would bring it further uphill, and the next derrick would bring it up. So I'm on the lookout for these derricks in both the quarrying pictures and in the construction pictures and see them if you look for them. Uh, what you won't see is any steam shovel, any power equipment. Mary Louise Curtis Fox specified that there was to be no power equipment, uh, men and animals only. And this was so that she could hire the maximum number of people. They were all men, of course, but uh, this was 1930 and she felt some obligation to, to keep people employed. And people were desperate for work. They were writing to her from miles around. I understand you're doing some work in Camden and could I have a job? I like this photograph. It does show uh, more Derek's, a couple of Derek's in the And this guy here, he's so happy. I've got a job. <laughs> Here's the 
uh, the uh, spillway is almost done and then the heavy duty masonry wall is almost done. But this, this photo shows how deep, we can't get any sense of how deep the, uh, mm. the dam is today because this rocks and leftover boulders have washed down into that crevice there. And there's the finished product. Smiling cow. Yes, smiling cow. <laughs> uh, and this photograph, just the best photograph I've ever seen of the, of the, uh, the ground of the Harbor Park because it, it plays out almost as well as a landscape sketch of what their intention was. In the deep part here, there's plantings, there's uh, the pathways running through, and all of the features they meant to. Uh, they meant to hmm. all the features they meant to feature. <laughs> so now I'll take a deep breath and ask a question. What does the historical record say about alewives in the Magani book? And here's a spoiler alert. Almost nothing. This is a very frustrating topic because I can't find anything in the record about alewives in Camden. Um and here's where I've looked. And I'm not the only one looking. I've got volunteers and historians who has mentioned to me that they couldn't find any record of alewives in Camden. Um, and we have looked in the Camden history. So that is John Locke's history of Camden written in 1859, N.C. Fletcher's in 1884, Rule Robinson in 1907. Um, there is one mention in John Locke's history of the 1806 town meeting in which it was brought up whether or not to, uh, to have a committee to look into the alewife situation, which I can go on uh, about later if you're if you're interested. Um, but one of those local historians, uh, Sandy Delano, suggested turn the question around. Don't look for evidence of alewives, but think about. What would it look like if there had been alewives? And to answer that question, we will look at the other towns nearby. And so I did. And in Belfast history, that is Williamson in 1877, Rockland, Thomas, and South Thomas, and then Eaton's history, and in Warren, again, Eaton in 1877, there's page after page of alewives. Alewives were vital to the early colonial life and industry and budget. Um, the Massachusetts state law declared that alewives were a community property, that it is the municipality could had the rights to collect any fees that they could, and there, the alewives that were caught were always reserved for the, the town poor first, and then they could sell them for to make up the budget of the town. But in all of these towns, it, well, let's see if I got some slides. Uh, I won't read these, but this Belfast mentioned in both 1769 and 1874 about the alewife run. I love this photograph too. So in, in the Dr. Rap River, the alewives were still running in 1928. And this sort of proves what I always suspected that fishing alewives was a party. And it was free poaching, just swimming up the river. All you needed was a dip net and you could dip out all the alewives you could eat, more than you could eat. I just imagine that everybody was sick of alewives after a couple of weeks of having alewives three, three, three times a week. Um, anyway, so you would walk out to these platforms and dip out the alewives and dump them into this trough and they would slide down to this basket and you would walk the basket over to, I assume this is the smokehouse, so right there you would uh, dip out the uh, alewives and smoke them and everybody could take home uh, smoked alewives. Has anybody had a smoked alewife? I went online and you can't get them. Um, you can't get them in season, um, but in rare places. So I think they're still smoking at Amherst Mills. This time of year, or do we have to wait for spring? Well, yeah. Only during the rock. Yeah. That's a brief. Well, thanks. Sorry, I'll have to make a trip. Amherst Mills has kind of a, an ale wife party. Because they, where the fish rider goes up and then yeah. they have the sluices coming down and they have kind of a historical group that. Well, I'll keep my eye out for that. I'd like to see the other ones and I definitely want to. 
not sure I'm gonna like it. But <laughs> <laughs> I do want to have a taste. Fishing, fishing, fishing and boiling, right? Uh, Thomas is itself Thomas, and, and does it bother anybody else that self Thomas is not actually self? <laughs> 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 it's it's South Rock Land it used to be part of Thomaston. It's so South Thomaston being South of Rock Land was of course part of this thing. Uh, from 1855, as I mentioned, on Wednesday, where you could occasionally catch a few alewives, which in early times, when salmon, shad, herring, smelts, whitings, and eels were were abundant in early times, this is a common thing in the history. There used to be used to be alewives here, and uh, the Mill River, which comes out. Of as you're approaching Thomaston from here, you go through a dip and you don't even know it, but you're going across the Mill River just before you rise back up into Thomaston. That's the Mill River, um, so called because there are mills on it. Um, this stream, now seldom frequented by alewives, is supposed to have formerly abounded with them as far up as Chippewaukee Lake. But from the earlier erection of a sawmill by Brigadier Waldo near the present mills at the bridge, they were shut out at an early period and the run broken up. And that was written in 1865. I won't go on and on about Warren, especially because the the St. George watershed, I looked it up, it's about nine times the size of the Magunico watershed. So they have nine times as much water and a flatter entry. So there's just a um, huge amount of record of the alewives in Warren. The earliest records are, of course, of the uh, of the Native Americans warning the settlers don't go up to the Upper Falls. That's our dam, and they were willing to go fight anybody, any English settlers. Some English settlers did go up the stream and never came back. Um, so the, it was deadly serious to the uh, to the Native Americans. I didn't mention that um, there has this documented. Oh, I've got that. For instance, the Maine Archaeological Society, this is the best article in here about a site upstream from Warren, upstream from the Upper Falls uh, at Arts Mills, um, which was on some maps called Wawanock Village, but they have found uh, carbon dating of 9,000 year old village there where they were, they were fishing um, in, in Warren. So it, it's exciting how long people have been here. And, uh, I will read this sentence because it says the year 1782, and that was during the American Revolution, like others during the war, was distinguished by a great scarcity of provisions and the difficulty of obtaining subsistence because the British had raided all up and down the coast. And they'd taken all the cows and the chickens and the hogs and left the people with nothing. Uh, when every resource was failing and the minds of all were filled with anxiety, Providence seemed in pity to hasten the arrival of alewives, which were caught at the Upper Falls the 27th of April. April death a little early for the arrival of the uh, alewives. On the following day, Sunday, large quantities were taken as a work of mercy for suffering families. And they made a point of, of saying that on Sunday, it was a work of mercy because it was not a, only immoral but illegal to fish on Sundays. But as a work of mercy to feed the starving families, it was an okay thing to do. So this picture is from Warren. That bridge is still there, or its settler is still there. This dam is no longer there. It ran diagonally downstream from the bridge. Um, and you can see that it was a, a substantially high and they did have a means for getting the alewives upstream, but of course they took a toll. And it's like a toll gate here. Uh, the, these guys were scooping out alewives and sending them um, across, I think that the uh, smokehouse was across the river, but this photograph is from 1913. And you could get alewives in Camden because the local grocers competed to see who could get the first alewives of the season. You see this line here, first out of delivery in town. <laughs> uh, Spoked war on alewives, two for five cents. So we could get alewives, but they, but they came from came from Warren. So that pretty much wraps up my prepared remarks. I'm happy to talk or tell you about some of the material we have here, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, or tell stories. <laughs>
my my dad worked in the mill, so when I was a kid, um, I could go after school down, go down Washington Street and pop in big open door and walk down the row of machines. And I was stunned. Even at the time, I was surprised that nobody ever said, hey, kid, get out of here. What are you doing here? They could <laughs> sit in there, and as I did, and just watch the looms and the shuttle going flying back and forth. Um, there were enormous cast iron pieces of equipment, and the shuttle, there's a couple in the case back there, but there's an arm which would hit the shuttle, and it, would, and it was loud. The shuttle would fly to the other end of the loom, and then the loom would do its thing, uh, capture that warp or weft, I forget which it is, and then the uh, the arm at the other end would whack that shuttle and come flying back. And so I'd just stand in <laughs> front trying to figure it, 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 it all out. Um, the, the we, weave masters were probably the highest paid people in the mill, um, and they were all men, and they were all deaf because of the uh, machinery. Um, yeah, everybody yelled at each other in the, uh, the weaving room floor. Um, Is that the Seabright Dam that with the white buildings? Yes, yeah, so oh. there, there, yeah, yeah. There's I think the, the ice out there. So that, yeah, that the dam portion there. That's the this is Washington Street. Around when is that photo from? Do you know? I don't know. It's it's fairly long because I was in an airplane. Uh huh. Early. Right. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if anyone on Zoom has questions, you can type them into the chat, and I will read them out loud. So would that be Mountain Street up there where you step right there? Yes. Yeah, Mountain Street. Was there ever an effort to have a hydroelectric power to try to? Yes, not not back in the finished days, but Joe Sawyer built a put in a dynamo in this very site here and generated electricity enough to pay for his effort, but. Um, he was required to rebuild the dam pretty much. Um, which really cut into his uh, his income, and basically it did not generate enough electricity to be worth the, the expense of maintaining the dam. Hmm. We have a question on Zoom. Um, do we know what the native name for Mount Batty was? Um, no, not really. McGonnycook was the name for the harbor. Adam Bedex was one name, but it's a little vague about whether that referred to Mount Batty. So where the term, where the name Mount Batty came from, it could have come from some garbled version of it. Mm -hmm. Indian name. I don't know. For, for many years, and it's written in the history that that um, James Richard's wife was named Elizabeth and known as Betty, and so they called it Betty's Mount or Mount Betty. Well, that's totally bogus. So you got to be careful. Oh no! <laughs> because Mount Betty was on maps preceding James Richard's ah. arrival. So mm. there, there's some made up history. Oh, you got to be wary of that. But... Mm. Mm. Well, anything else from online? Not at the moment. Wish I had been to a lecture like this when we first moved here. So all <laughs> these years, 47 years, I would have known more about it instead of learning about it now. Well, you made it this time. Oh, I, I, know, they were, I had no idea there were so many. I didn't. I mean, I knew about a few of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Well, um, I will share one final anecdote with you. I used to walk home past the mill of Washington Street with Johnny McGowan, who lived a couple streets up from me. and. Uh, and there were always guys hanging out of the windows at the mill. And so they would yell down to us because we had reasonably long hair in those days. They'd say, get a haircut. But Johnny McGowan formal response, which was, get a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a few words uh, of the Camden Mill while well, put together by a volunteer, Jen Healy. And, oh, Jen, here you go. Thank you. I'm going to do more after tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Anything you want to add about the brochures? Or... No, I guess just uh, we grew up in a mill town in Connecticut. Um, and so when we came here, 
he started walking around, they hear the sound of the dams and then walking through mm -hmm. the mills. It's just, there's something about it that just pulls you in, the family histories. And when you talked about your great aunt Nettie and uh, how it was like the family in, in one of the mills in Connecticut, they, they would have people come in and read to the people while they were working on the mills. Uh, to help them through the day, and that it was a, a family atmosphere. So, but to you, to your point, we used to walk home from school through the Cheney silk mills, and so we hear the sound yeah. of the of some of the that were still um, working, but we hear the sound of the bigger places. So, just moving here, we we were meant to be here back in mill town. <laughs> Oh, hey, I should mention the smell of the mill, especially the woolen mill, because it smelled like lamb It was just so pleasant. My my dad came home smelling like lamb wool, <laughs> which was better than my friend Jerry Sutter, whose dad worked at his chicken factory. <laughs> Do you think there were uh, French Canadians that came down to work the mills, or was it mostly uh, Mainers that worked in the mills? Mostly Mainers. I don't remember. French names much at all. Do you know how the Babs were connected with the woolen mill? Yes, the Babs owned the mill. Um, Teresa Parker Babb, Teresa Parker was the daughter of Moses Parker who ran the tannery of Tannery Lane, which mm -hmm. there's, there's no nothing left of the tannery. Right. Uh, she married Charles Babb, and Charles Babb rose up through the ranks to become the manager and I think the owner of um, and there's been a couple more generations of that. Yeah, my kids went to school with the, the, the twins. generation. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. So the Babs are still around. Well, Issa is yeah. and yeah. her children. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a working woolen mill in Maine that can be visited. Mm -hmm. It's right. called Bartlett Mills, and it is upstate. and my retrieval system is not open <laughs> town right now, but they have open houses. It's no longer water power, but it is on the river. It's, it's one of those towns that is not near salt water, and I'm not good at towns that are not salt water. But I think in the spring, but they process all of the local. Whoa. Farmers yeah. and, they, and they still have this giant mill operating, and it is a, an amazing thing to watch because it runs across, back and forth across the floor by 15 feet. Right, the spinning equipment. Yeah. While, while, and it's, it, and it, if you can, if someone has a better retrieval system than I, I think it's in or, harmony. 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 Hey, Harmony, Harmony name. Harmony, thank you. Just speaking to the next generation. Food yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take credit for the retrieval system. My daughter is Harmony, thank you. Yeah. But it is, I, I have gone there several times to this open house, and it is, all of this equipment is still running when you turn it essentially. Wow. Huh. Oh, and and they still have the old lifts that that pick the wool out of the bales and well, there's a technical term, fluff it. Yeah. And and it and it's a, it, it, and as far as I know, it is still operating. It's mostly a hobbyist thing now. Mm -hmm. People people buy expensive wool to knit things. Uh, it's really interesting. Huh? My, my dad took me uh, just before the mill closed, took me into the wool sorting building um, where there was one master who he just reached into the bins and he could tell me what kind of sheep it came from and where where on the animal it came from. Yeah. The finest hair, mm -hmm. the hair, but then he would sort it depending on what the mead was, but the different quality of the different wool he would sort it out in. And they would spin the yarn from it. I think that the farmers would use spray paint. Now, I think they use spray paint to identify their wool so, so that Mr. Smith will spray his sheep orange. And then when the wool 
they, they so they're able to a portrait whose wool huh. is is getting used. I'm a little counterproductive. Maybe I'm just in her own. Because I know you said that it's more about uh, the woolen mill made the felts for the paper mill, but around town we all had Knox woolen blankets. Yeah, my understanding is that just for around here, or did they also sell those? I, I, my, the way I understand it, and I could be wrong, was that they, they made those blankets out of felt that came back from the factory. They softened them up and reworked them. So that's why they were so extremely heavy. And, and yes, in, in homes around town, if you find a heavy, heavy, heavy woolen blanket, it is from the remains of a uh, an awesome woolen mill. Well, we got a Knox will like it from your parents for our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> uh, rooster shirts. I had a rooster shirt. It was a red wool. Yes, shirt. we had rooster snowsuits, and <laughs> after rolling in the snow, you, you couldn't see the wool anymore. <laughs> But it didn't hurt the wool. You just bring them in and put them by the heater and wear them the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I would be able to um, oh. <laughs> so were they all mainers who were the experts on sheep and wool, or did they bring in like Irish or Scott? You know. No, it was it was a homegrown. It was. Homegrown. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they brought in any foreign experts for this for these trades. Not like the uh, carving the granite out on the islands, where those are all Swedes and uh, Italians. And... and there were many sheep farms locally? Yes. Um, no, all of those stone walls running through the woods, those were not, they didn't grow crops out there because, as, as you know, walking through the woods, there is no, there's no soil, right? But the, the, uh, the stone walls would keep the sheep. And the cows where they belong. So, I, I think most of those fields now woods were were for sheep. So Tony Bach, who um, raised sheep, told me that it was the merino sheep was the what made made, made all the difference. The merino sheep um, put out a great quality and quantity of wool in this environment in, in this climate. So he said that that's what helped turn the corner when the merino sheep arrived from. Australia, I guess. Well, thank you all very much. Anything else uh, on your end, Julia? No. Nope. Thank you. Okay.